They want to remove me, to silence me, to discredit me. They have tried to stop me in every possible way, from taking my finances, to imprison me, to slander me, to linking me to Darren Osborne and extremism. Now they want to take away the final thing I have, my voice. I said to myself, when I get back to Leeds, I'm going to check, and if these nine men are Muslim names, then I'm, finally I've got to get over my fear that this is a story it's impossible to cover because it is the far right's dream story. Innocent white girls, evil, dark-skinned men. How do you cover that? But I can't carry on ignoring it. And sure enough, when I got back, I looked up. It was indeed as, as I'd thought. I refuse to say that Tommy Robinson is a Nazi. I refuse to say that he is a fascist. Now, I don't agree with him on everything, and I'm sure he wouldn't agree with me on everything. But it seems to me that if you've got somebody who, who just, as far as I know, has never said a racist thing, but has a very big problem with the Islamic extremists who he saw on his streets and was talking about long before some other people were willing to. He's a working class guy who doesn't have a PhD, and is worried about his country, you know, and I refuse to join in the demonization of everybody um, just because it's helpful in the short term. What happened in the United Kingdom last week is an absolute disgrace. Tommy Robertson, a freedom fighter and Islam critic, was jailed, while the judge issued a gag order to silence the media. Robinson had been uh, arrested and uh, sent to prison within hours. Uh, there was actually a reporting restriction on that in the UK that made it impossible for any British journalist like myself to write about it for some days, which meant that the international media picked it up, but uh, here in Britain we, we weren't allowed to talk about it. For too long in this country, we, media, the establishment, society, the chattering classes, the liberal elite, whatever term you want to use, have ignored the issue of grooming gangs, of young, vulnerable teenage girls who have been uh, victimised, drugged and raped and abused. People need to know what's going on. People need to know these court cases are happening. Obviously, the problem is you have people out who think I'm a wanker for reporting on it. It's not, what's it got to do with you? What's it got to do with you? What's it got to do with me? I'm an English man and they're English girls. Fears of racism prevented us from coming to the defence of vulnerable underage girls. Fears of racism meaning uh, that the state was scared that it would be accused of being racist if it rightly arrested and prosecuted British Pakistani, largely British Pakistani Muslim men, uh, in their abuse of underage white teenage girls. Residents now feel they can no longer rely on police in these issues and they're patrolling and highlighting and trying to combat this epidemic. I, I think something very bad has happened in recent years in relation to this. I think there has been a very opportunistic thing, particularly from the left, to identify everybody they disagree with as Nazis and fascists and racists. Now, there's a lot of problems with this. One is that I think very often, demonstrably, it's not true. Um, and increasingly, people have been able to see it's not true. But, you know, like Anne Cryer, the Labour MP who I think first spoke about what turned out to be the Rotherham uh, sex gang scandal was was called a racist by loads of people. At the time. Okay, Anne Cryer is not a racist. It's just so obvious. But these people in this country and across Europe diminished the term and diminished all of these terms, and they did it, I think, for short-term political gain. One of Robinson's chief causes is raising awareness about sexual abuse, grooming, and rape committed in his country by immigrants, mostly from the Islamic world. Those crimes are ones that local authorities have ignored in order to avoid being called bigoted. Last year, Robinson attempted to cover a gang rape trial involving several Muslim men in Canterbury. For that, he was arrested, given a suspended jail sentence, and told not to cover any further trials. Undeterred, this past weekend, he performed a live stream outside a sexual abuse grooming trial in Leeds. In a free country, of course, anybody ought to be able to say what they think on a public street, but Britain is not a free country anymore. It takes a bit of courage to address something uh, that people will hurl abuse at you for talking about. I know on this show, on, this, on my own show on the weekends, um, I've tried to book uh, certain MPs to come on and address the issue of grooming gangs, and on multiple times they've had to back away from fear of the backlash. We recall Sarah Champion, who in the Labour Party attempted to address this and lost her position in the front bench as a result. 
the, these are the things the general public in the majority are worried about. How can you express that worry without being a Nazi fascist racist? I think there are lots of people who are concerned about these things who are not Nazis, not racist, not fascist. And we will do a great disservice to our future if, if we, as I say, for short-term political gain, point the finger at everyone. He was speaking his views on a public street when he was arrested and convicted immediately and sentenced to over a year in prison. Am I mischaracterizing that? You're not at all. Um, that's exactly what happened. He was outside the court. He was reporting on uh, the trial of a grooming gang, as I would call it, a rape squad. It's a cause, as you rightly say, that he's believed in for so many years. And he's one of those people who's been calling this out relentlessly, despite all of the slurs that are made against him. And yet, within five hours, he was arrested, he was tried, and he was sent to prison for 13 months. Since the late 90s, 13 different thousand cities, 56 men convicted. Three of the 56 were white, 53 were Asian names, 50 of them were Muslim names, and when we looked into each case, the overwhelming majority were Pakistani Muslim. Okay, so we had a kind of evidential base, but what the hell are you going to do about it? Um, we needed to start talking to people, and so I tried to start talking to police forces, to specialists, to experts who would look after children, um, to government departments, and there was a complete wall of silence. It's a cultural thing which is going on within their community, and no one dare say it. I sat and watched Question Time, and when I watched Question Time, all I could see our political leaders was trying to explain that Jack Straw could have dressed it up a little bit better. And rather, and talking about these girls like they're statistics. They're not so, statistics. These girls are, well, who's, whose daughters do you think these are? Whose sisters? They're ours in working class towns and communities. And people are right. fed up with what's going on, We've been, and it is being ignored. For 20 years, our, 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 our councillors and the, and, the, and the leaders from the Islamic community have conspired with the police to not deal with Muslim pimping gangs. They've allowed systematic rape of our youth. There have been multiple cases now, and it's beyond any level of doubt that there's a disproportionate number of British Muslims involved in grooming gangs against underage white girls. And to say that is to, say, is to report on the facts. Uh, it's not to be racist. All we get, if anything, were, were the terse statement, you know, ethnicity, culture has absolutely no relevance whatsoever to this pattern of offending. Um, in the end, I found one small charity which worked with the families of victims, and through them, I got to know some of the families and to understand that the court cases where people were actually being prosecuted were actually a tiny, tiny minority, because in most cases, Parents had been trying really hard to get help for their kids. They were going and knocking on doors. They were pleading with social services, with police to do something, and nothing was happening. And with, with the issues I'm talking about, Jeremy, if I ask you, do you know anyone that's hooked on heroin sold to them by Muslim gangs? You probably don't. I do. Do you know any beautiful girls that you went to school with that are now wearing a burqa that, that don't see their family? Probably don't. I do. Do you know anyone who's been murdered by a Muslim gang? You probably don't. I do. Do you know any 15-year-old girls that you know that you've grown up with that have so, been raped or pimped? You don't. So I don't expect you to all, understand the issues. These are all personal issues of yours. I wish that those young girls had seen justice served for them, as fast as the judge served Tommy Robinson justice in this case. Because in this case, it's very easy for us to pick on the bogeyman. But actually, the truth is that our silence over decades in this country is the real bogeyman. And that's the real thing we should despise, our own cowardice in the face of grooming of young girls up and down this country and our conspiracy of silence. We were ready to publish, and we published that first story in January 2011. Within two days, Jack Straw, the former Home Secretary, went on news night and said that some young Pakistani men in his Blackburn constituency viewed white girls as easy meat, which created further headlines. I was called down to London for my very first ever one-to-one -one meeting with the editor of The Times. Um, I'd been told he was quite pleased with the impact of the story, and I thought I was going to get a pat on the back and be told I'd done a good job. Um, instead, he told me this was now going to be my full-time job. I thought we'd done it, but he said we were going to carry on keeping running stories about this until any 
pointed from his office out through the glass surround into the newsroom until the day comes when every single one of your colleagues arrives for work one morning, picks up the front page of the Times and says, oh my God, not another bloody story about child sexual exploitation. That's the day, he said, when I'll know we're finally starting to make a difference. <laughs>